This is part two of the section on time and censoring concepts in event history analysis. This part introduces a series of six questions to answer before conducting any event history analysis. Remember a previous screencast where we introduced lifelines. They represent the different ways to enter or exit the population at risk. The obvious way are through birth and death, as well as by enumeration at the start of the follow-up study, and by right censoring at the end of the follow-up study. Also, we have seen that the population at risk is closely linked to the issue of migration. We have seen that migration status can be allocated to all individuals depending on when they in or out migrated from the study area. Of course, this diagram only represents a simplified version of migration histories. There can be much more complicated migration histories with the succession of in and out migrations and gaps of different durations. Another diagram is useful to represent how individuals are entering or exiting the study area through migration. Generally, the majority of the population is staying in the study area from the beginning of observation, that is birth or enumeration, through the time of last valid observation or the time of their death. The time at risk as non-migrant is represented in green here. Some of these non-migrants eventually may out-migrate and be lost to follow up. That is, they will never be seen again. Until the time of their first out-migration, they are considered as non-migrants. Among those who out-migrated, some will eventually return and be considered as return migrants at the time of right censoring. The time at risk as return migrants is represented in orange here. The population at risk will also be formed by in-migrants, of which a fraction will stay until the time of last valid observation or death. The time at risk as in-migrant is represented in yellow here. Some of these in-migrants eventually may out-migrate and be lost to follow up. Among those who out-migrated, some will actually return and be considered as return migrants in orange in this diagram. When designing an event history analysis, use this diagram to figure out what is your population at risk. Also, you can add numbers in each category, for example, numbers of out-migrants, new in-migrants, in-migrants who out-migrated, lost to follow-up, return migrants, etc. You can also compute the total person years in each category, green, yellow, and orange. It is worth noting that time span in white in this diagram do not belong to the population at risk and are therefore excluded from the analysis. Now we come to the crux of this lesson on concepts of event history analysis. We introduce here a series of six questions that you should always answer before starting any event history analysis on any kind of longitudinal data. Each question corresponds to a specific concept in event history analysis. We talked a lot about the time at risk in the preceding lessons. Therefore, it might surprise you that the very first question to answer is about space. Where is the population under observation? This refers to the spatial universe covered by the study area. Be it a survey, national register, panel, HDSS or census, the data only covers a specific area. It can be through exhaustive data collection or through sampling, but it is always limited to a specific space. You need to know what is the space that your data cover. There should be exact correspondence between the spatial universe and the person years at risk accounted in your analysis. 
no time spent outside your study area should be included in your analysis. In HDSS, the spatial universe is pretty straightforward to define. It is limited by the HDSS boundaries. But in cohort studies, it is more tricky. Often, the spatial universe is defined by follow-up visits, either at the health facility or at the respondent's home. The spatial limits are vague. They are more institutional. The health facility or respondent's households and conditional on follow-up. The notion of catchment area might be useful for cohort studies. A catchment area is the space covered by the health facility from which the study is conducted. The second question is, how is the entry into observation defined? This refers to the concept of entry time. The entry time is the earliest possible events that define entry into observation. For example, in HDSS, it is birth, enumeration, and in-migration. In a birth cohort study, it is birth. In retrospective studies, it is birth and in-migration. The third question is, who can experience the events? Most of the time, it is the entire population in your study. However, this depends on the event. Actually, this question is as much about the event as it is about the population at risk. One cannot be defined without the other. For example, if you collected data on fertility, you probably asked female respondents about their birth histories. Although you can relate these birth histories to male partners in the population through their linkages with mothers, in standard fertility analysis, the population at risk is limited to female of reproductive age. In studies on specific diseases, very often the population at risk is limited to a specific age group. For example, it wouldn't make sense to study Alzheimer in the whole population when only people age 40 or more are susceptible to the disease. Once the broad definition of the event is agreed on, it is necessary to define the events more precisely. It might be that the event is not as homogeneous as it seems. For example, when referring to birth history, do you want to include miscarriages, abortions and stillbirths? Or do you want to limit yourself to live births? What is the limit between a stillbirth and a live birth? Similarly, Although death looks first as a unique event in a lifetime, you might be interested in the various causes of death. What are the different causes? How are they grouped? What to do with undetermined cause of death? An event can be defined as a transition from one status to another. This transition might not be so neat as it seems in the first place. For example, when does death exactly occurs? What about the time of death for comatose patients that are artificially kept alive? Similarly, a migration identifies a period before and after a change of residence. But when does the migration exactly occur? The journey from a residence to the next may take several days. The move might involve several to and fro between the two residences. If you stayed in a friend's place while looking for a residence of your own, when does the new residence begin? In the day you left your former residence or on the first night you slept in your new residence? Eventually, we are coming to the question on censoring and truncation. Similarly to the event, is the censoring uniquely defined? The easiest censoring to deal with is the end of valid observation, the OBE. Remember that in HDSS, it is the time until which all individual identifiers have been reconciled. Loss to follow up usually involves a migration out of the study area, but it can also be defined by another event such as respondent's refusal to cooperate may be because of respondent fatigue. Lastly, the censoring might be only temporary. 
Is the censoring reversible? This will define gaps. The definition of gaps is related to the definition of censoring in general, as well as entry time that we have seen before. Now let's come back to the important issue of censoring and truncation. An elementary principle of event history analysis is that censoring an event should be independent of one another. To quote famous authors, an individual who is censored at time c should be representative of all those subjects with the same values of the explanatory variable who survived to c. In retrospective data, the study population has necessarily been selected among the survivors who did not migrate at the time of the survey. In other words, there is a selection bias due to death and migration out of the study area. This is a major problem since the assumption of independence between censoring due to death or out migration on one hand and the event of interest on the other hand might not hold. For example, if you study fertility in your study area and that females who have fewer children leave to other places, then fertility will appear higher in retrospective birth histories. Follow-up data collection as HDSS reduces the selection biases due to right censoring on the condition that reason for out-migration is known. This is necessary to establish the independence between censoring and the event of interest. If there is no independence, then you should clearly say in which direction is the selection bias, that is how the selection bias affects your results. Whatever the data at stake, right censoring is always present. You will have to remember that all descriptive and regression models make the assumption of independence between event and censoring. It is extremely difficult to control for biases due to censoring. This is still an unresolved and very technical field in mathematical statistics. What about left censoring? Well, it is about the same story as for right censoring. It is inherent to all longitudinal data, and most of the time left censoring is not independent from the event. First, you must check whether the event of interest has been experienced before left censoring or not. If you don't know, then you have left truncation and things are even worse. Interval censoring or gap is defined as right censoring followed by left censoring. With gaps, you have to check for the independence assumption both at right and at left. This means that as for left truncation, you have to check what happened during the gap. Gaps are usually dealt with using retrospective data collection to cover the time span during the gap. This is particularly relevant for renewable events. You don't want to miss one event because the individual happened to be out of the study area for some time. This is closing the section on fundamental concepts of event history analysis. Many thanks for your kind attention.